In this short video, we're going to talk about Green's theorem, which really is another form of the fundamental theorem of calculus relating a line integral to a double integral. So let's review evaluating a double integral. So we're going to calculate the double integral of 2xy over a type one region, type one region, meaning that we have a top curve and a bottom curve. So our top curve is y2 equals four minus one half x squared. The bottom curve is y1, which equals one quarter x cubed minus two x. These two curves intersect at negative two comma two and two radical two comma zero on the x axis. So if I wanted to evaluate this integral, the inner integral would have to be a dy integral with the bounds being the equation for the lower curve and the upper curve respectively. And then x varies from, well, negative two on the left to two radical two on the right. So we'll go ahead and take the partial antiderivative with respect to y. And then we would evaluate that between y equals one quarter x cubed minus two x and y equals four minus one half x squared. So I'm not gonna complete the evaluation. I'm just gonna write this as two separate integrals. And then I'm gonna pause here and think of how I can relate this to line integrals. So let's look at as our upper curve as being a path C2, our lower curve as being a path C1. Then the union of those two curves and see how they're oriented as well. We're moving in each case in a uh, clockwise direction or if we were walking on these paths, we're keeping our region R to the left. So parameterization of C1 would just be x equals x1. Y would be the equation for y1, which is one quarter x cubed minus two x. And that's good for x between negative two and two radical two. And then for C2, well, C2 moves generally from right to left and it would be a little bit challenging to parameterize it. So no matter, what we'll do instead is we will parameterize the opposite of C2. That means we, we would be moving uh, on the curve in the opposite direction. So starting from the left and going to the right, the opposite direction of the arrows that are drawn. And then we can just use this natural parameterization where X equals X and Y equals four minus one half X squared with the same bounds on x. And then our curve C is going to be the union of C1 and C2. Well, with those definitions, these two integrals that I've written are gonna turn out to be line integrals. I'm just missing one piece. I'm gonna define another function, P of x comma y, which equals xy squared, to be the integrand after I perform the partial antiderivative with respect to y. So then this first integral is really a line integral of that function p over the path negative c2. And the second one is a line integral of the function p over the path c1. So just think about it. Um, this, um, these bounds right here would be the bounds I would get if I were to use the given parameterizations. Now, the line integral over the opposite of c2, I could rewrite that as the line integral along C2, 
but I just have to change the sign out in front of it. And then I can combine those together because the path C is the union of C1 and C2. And so that would be the opposite of the line integral along the closed path C. Remember the circle on the integral sign tells me that it's a closed path of this function P. Now, we could also, using the same terminology, look at the previous steps before I wrote this as two separate integrals. For example, this step would be, oh, I'm taking the uh, integral from negative 2 to radical 2. Actually, it should be 2 radical 2, I guess I should make that quick correction here. There should be 2 radical 2 of my function p between these two functions here, y1 and y2. I'm just rewriting this integral using this new notation, using the p function. Now, what did I do from this step here to get to this step? I took the antiderivative of the integrand with respect to y. So now to go in the opposite direction, so to go in reverse, I would need to take the partial derivative with respect to y. And so now I have the double integral, the inner integral has the equations uh, of the upper and lower curve. Now my integrand before was p, but I said to go backwards I'd have to take the partial derivative with respect to y. So now I have the partial derivative of p with respect to y. And if I complete this, then I'll have the double integral over r of the partial derivative of p with respect to y. So that tells me that if I just move the minus sign over onto the double integral, that the line integral over the boundary of r of this function p is going to be the opposite of the double integral of the partial of p with respect to y dA. And really, there's nothing special about this particular uh, function that I chose for my original integrand. And so we could say that this is going to be true in general for any type 1 region for any type of integrand. And I should be able to repeat this analysis with a type 2 region where I have a right curve, in this case x2 equals sine of pi over 4y, and a left curve, which is x1 equals y squared minus 4y. r is the region contained in that. I'll choose the same integrand just because it's easy to work with, but it could be really any function here. So I'll set up the double integral. This time dx has to be on the inside because it's a type 2 region. I have a right and left curve. So right on the top and left curve on the bottom. Take the antiderivative with respect to x this time. And again, write it as two separate integrals. So again, I want to rethink this in terms of its boundary curves. So again, I'm going to be moving in an anti-clockwise direction or counterclockwise direction. So C2 here uh, goes in the positive direction of y, so going from 0 to 4. C1 goes in the opposite direction. So we'll really, when we parameterize this, 
we'll look at the opposite of C1. It will be easier to parameterize. So the parameterization uh, for the opposite of C1 would just be, well, y is my independent variable. So I'll just use keep that as y. And then x will be y squared minus 4y. And y goes from 0 to 4. Again, we're looking at the opposite because as y goes from 0 to 4, I would be moving in a clockwise direction around this parabola. But I want to be consistent in moving in a counterclockwise direction. So that's fine. It's just the parameterization of the opposite of C1. It'll work out fine in our analysis. Then the curve C2 is, again, y is my independent variable, so that'll be my parameter. And then x is going to be sine of pi over 4y with the same bounds on y, y going from 0 to 4. Again, we'll call the union of those two curves just plain old c. And we're going to define a new function, q, to be the integrand here after I had performed the partial anti-differentiation with respect to x. So now with this terminology, I can rewrite these two integrals as line integrals. The first one is the line integral over the curve C2 of this function I defined, Q. And uh, the second one is the line integral over the opposite of the curve C1. So I'd like to have this second integral be written as a line integral along the curve C1 in this uh, counterclockwise direction. So that's fine. All I have to do is change the sign in front of the integral. So in this case, from negative to positive. And so now I can combine these as a single line integral over the closed curve C. And I could work my way back up towards the double integral using this same notation. So for example, here I would have the integral from, well, 0 to 4 of q evaluated, q of x comma y evaluated between x sub 1 and x sub 2. Now, how did I get this x squared y? I took the partial antiderivative uh, with respect to x. So now to go in the other direction, I'll need to take the partial derivative with respect to x. So then this would be the integral from 0 to 4, the integral from x1 to x2 of the partial of q with respect to x dx dy, which says that the original, I could think of the original uh, double integral as being the double integral of r over the partial of q with respect to x dA. So now we see that we have the line integral over the closed curve C of q dy equaling the double integral of dA of partial of q with respect to x. All right. Now if I have a region which is a simple curve, it could be viewed as type 1 or type 2, I could combine those two results. And I could say that the line integral over this closed curve C of PDX plus QDY is going to be the double integral of the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y dA. And that is what Green's theorem tells us, more or less. A little bit more carefully, so let's go through the wording. So we're going to start with the region R in the plane. And its boundary is a simple closed curve C, so something that we've got in our diagram here. And it just needs to be piecewise smooth. 
if I have a vector field with component functions p and q, and it's a smooth vector field, so we're going to smooth really means that it has continuous first order partial derivatives, it has to be defined on the entire region R and on the boundary C. Then the line integral of f dot dr, that'd be the same thing as p dx plus q dy written in a different way, is going to be the double integral of the difference between these partial derivatives. So what this allows us to do realistically is to uh, use a double integral to calculate a line integral. It's a little bit hard to go in the opposite direction. It'd be very difficult to recognize a, uh, for example, a double integral as having this form of the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. But if we have a, uh, a line integral where maybe the parameterization is very challenging, or, or the evaluation after the parameterization is challenging, it may be much simpler to just deal with it as a, a double integral. Plus the fact that you're taking these partial derivatives may simplify the integrand as well. Uh, and one last part about Green's theorem is that we are <clears throat> we will traverse the curve C so that R is always on the left side of C. So if we're looking, you know, at the top view, it'll be traversed in a counterclockwise direction. So here we have a uh, line integral, and we're going to evaluate it using Green's theorem. Uh, our curve C is the uh, boundary between the curves uh, y equals 2x squared and y equals 2x over uh, x ranging between 0 and 1. So that's the this region right here between the line and the parabola. And um, we are going to have c traversed in this clockwise direction. So going up C1, going down C2. And let's use Green's theorem. My P function is x squared plus y squared. Q is 2x squared y. Let's take the partial of P with respect to y. I'll get 2y. And the partial of Q with respect to x. So now setting up the double integral, my integrand is partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. And the bounds go from, well, the curve, lower curve is the parabola, the upper curve is the line. That's for the inner integral, the dy. For dx, our bounds are just from 0 to 1. So we'll go ahead and work that out. Calculating the antiderivative is pretty simple. And uh, evaluating that between y equals 2x squared and y equals 2x, we just get a polynomial, take its antiderivative, and just evaluate that between 0 and 1. You get 2 fifteenths. Now, in this simple example, um, we could actually go ahead and uh, check this by directly evaluating the line integral instead of using the double integral in Green's theorem. So for example, C1, we could use the parameterization where x equals x and y equals 2x squared. Uh, if I keep it in this form here, all I need to know is that uh, dy equals 4x uh, dx, all right? And so I would evaluate x squared plus y squared in parentheses times dy. That'll get replaced with the 4x dx plus 2x squared dy. Again, replaced with the 4x dx. And I can write that with the 
dx, just a single dx, and collect all the like terms. Just get a polynomial in x, take the antiderivative, and evaluate that between 0 and 1. All right, let's do the same thing with the curve c2, but because we're going where uh, x is uh, decreasing, if I go in the direction of c2, it'll be easier for us to first parameterize the opposite of c2. So we'll have y equals 2x, and x will go from 0 and 1. x will be increasing. Here, dy is 2x. And again, we'll go ahead and replace that dy with the 2dx. Um, and I see there's a problem here. Oh, just in my writing. My calculations are fine. So let me go ahead and make this correction here. So that I should have said dx. See that in my calculations here. Um, I did replace uh, y with 2x squared, but I kept the dx as dx here. So that was good. And I think I did the same thing down here. So let's just, again, make my corrections. I should have said dx, dx there. But the rest of the, the calculation is correct. And the reason why I feel really good about it being correct is that after I do the uh, antiderivative and the evaluation, I get uh, remember, this is for minus C2. I get this expression, 5 thirds plus 2. And then if I were to combine those two together, why do I have the minus here? Because this was minus C2. I'd want to have the integral over C2. And uh, so I have to just change the sign. And that evaluates again to 2 over 15. So let me again make a quick correction here. And let's look at another example then. So here we're given a vector field. Uh, negative y over x squared plus y squared and x over x squared plus y squared. Uh, we've seen something like this without where the denominator was just 1 or the denominator had radical x squared plus y squared. Um, so we're a little bit familiar with this. And we're going to use the region R, which is just the a unit disk with the origin missing. And we have to leave out the origin because our vector field is not defined at the origin. And the curve C is just going to be the unit circle, so the boundary of that unit disk. And so what we'd like to do is evaluate the double integral of the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y and the line integral over the boundary. And we're going to have to do some explaining. So clearly, we're going to get some kind of unexpected result here. So q uh, is uh, the second uh, component function. So it's x over x squared plus y squared. Taking the partial with respect to x, I'll have to use the quotient rule. And then after I use the quotient rule, I can combine some like terms in the numerator to get negative x squared plus y squared over the quantity x squared plus y squared all squared. p is my first component function. Again, to calculate the partial of p with respect to y, I'll need to use the quotient rule. 
and then combining the like terms in the numerator, I get negative x squared plus y squared over the quantity x squared plus y squared squared. So the partial of q with respect to x is the same as the partial of p with respect to y. Hmm. That was a condition which under certain circumstances would say that this uh, vector field would be a conservative vector field. At least for sure, we can say that the double integral is going to be zero. Now, if this were a conservative vector field, we would expect that it would be independent of path. The line integral would be independent of path. And since we're asked to take a line integral over a closed curve, then we would expect that the line integral would also equal zero. Or at least that's what Green's theorem would say. Well, let's actually calculate it and see what happens. To parameterize the unit circle, we'll use the standard cosine of t, sine of t, where t goes from zero to two pi, which means that r prime is negative sine of t comma cosine of t. And that if I write my uh, vector field in terms of t, well, uh, sine squared plus cosine squared is going to be 1. So I don't have to be concerned about the denominator. That's going to be 1. So I just need negative sine of t. That'd be negative y. Cosine of t is x. And now if I calculate the uh, dot product of those two vectors, I get sine squared t plus cosine squared t, which is just 1. So my line integral using this parameterization would just be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 dt. And that is definitely not 0. In fact, it's 2 pi. So what's going on here? Why do I get two different answers? Why do I not have, for example, a conservative vector field, uh, which would be independent of, I mean, the line integral is dependent independent of path, which would mean that I should get a zero here. Well, it all has to do with the fact that this uh, domain here, this R, leaves out the origin. The origin is not in our disk, and so our disk has a hole in it. So since it's disk doesn't have, is not, excuse me, since the disk has a hole in it, it's not a simply connected region. And so our result about the partial of q with respect to x equaling the partial of q with respect p with respect to y being equal to each other does not mean that the vector field has to be conservative. And our Green's theorem wouldn't hold over this region because um, f is not defined on the entire region. It's not defined at the origin. So our, our vector field f is not conservative, even though we have these equal partial derivatives. And that's because the region has a hole in it.